Hey, hey, welcome to Page Break. I'm your host, Brian McClellan, coming to you on a blistering winter afternoon in the mountains of Utah. My guest this week is tabletop game designer Chris Birch. Chris is the founder and publisher of Modifius, a company that creates role-playing games, board games, and war games in a diverse range of original and licensed properties, including Dune, Star Trek, Fallout, Homeworld, Skyrim, Conan, James Bond, and more. Before founding Modifius, Chris managed bands, tours, and nightclubs for the dance music industry, and ran a video game fashion label. Chris and I talk about Modifius, the magnificent backlist of licensed properties they've been able to work with, how much sociability and the convention circuit matters to a gaming company, and how fantasy art has changed over the years. We also cover Chris's past jobs, including how those experiences paved the way for Modifius, and how happy accidents drive both our personal and professional lives. Enjoy my conversation with Chris Birch. Hey, how's life been doing? Yeah, very good. Survived the chaos of the last couple of years. <laughs> um, it was about three years since I met you, I think, at um, that wonderful Polish con. Yeah, yeah, that was a great one. I think that was my last foreign convention before COVID hit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that that was a fun one. I really liked that. Um, do you find that a lot of your kind of business revolves around conventions? Because I know that like Gen Con is obviously massive for the gaming community. It is. It's, I mean, conventions are a chance to meet people who might not find you through your usual channels. Yeah. But we didn't suffer by not doing any conventions for nearly two years. So, and, you know, our business grew. It's, you know, and, and I got lots more work done because, of course, when you're away, a convention is really a week. It doesn't matter whether it is, is a two-day show, a three-day show. By the time you fly out or you travel there, and then, you know, you've got to catch up. It's a good week out of the business. And there's a lot of emails to catch up on. And then maybe you come back with more silly ideas <laughs> that you have to uh, deal with. So it it adds a lot of work. I mean, of course, you make money. Some shows, you know, Gen Con's a great show for making money. It's also a great show for spending money. <laughs> um, you know, one of the most expensive. But um, if, if we never did a convention again we make enough money. Like some companies really rely on conventions, but we have enough business going through distribution and our web store and other, other routes. So, um, you know, it's plenty to keep us going. I mean, you know, it's great doing conventions because you meet people and I like selling games to people. You know, I like, I think everyone should be at the coal face and meet customers and, you know, just hear why they love your stuff or why they don't love your stuff. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you should never be too removed from people, uh, that you don't know what they're talking about. So, um, and, and, you know, it's good to meet the people that work for you, your freelance writers who turn up from, you know, who live locally and it's good to walk around because we're all geeks. So we all go and geek out about all the other games that everyone else makes. And then we trade and, you know, and, uh, go, Oh my God, I got this thing. It's really awesome. So for me, the exciting thing about going to something like Gen Con is to see, to find all the cool indie stuff that I would never hear about through the distributors or, you know, the cool little game that's been handmade out of wood or, you know, that, uh, you know, was a local hit. So that's more, much, much more interesting for me. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. It's, it's funny to think about that kind of, kind of from a, a writer's perspective with conventions, it's, it tends to be, um, Man, I, I don't want to say more casual, but like you don't I don't think any writer goes to a convention expecting to make any money. Like it's there. Yeah. Uh, there isn't really like a Gen Con where you like, oh, this is a convention that I probably will move so many books and things like that. Um, yeah. But it does seem very important for kind of getting out and and kind of the same thing you were talking about of of getting to meet people that are reading what you do. And, you know, part of that is just like kind of the gratification, right? Of yeah. like, of like, oh yeah, hey, somebody actually likes me, uh, <laughs> rather than random people on the internet. Yeah. But I do think part of it is, you know, being able to talk to people in person and and find out what they're thinking, and you know, because they'll come up to you and they'll tell you, oh, they'll immediately tell you, oh, my favorite character was X, 
you know, stuff like little, little bits of experience like that. Yeah. And well, also because a writer is a solo job. So, you know, you, uh, it's great getting people time, isn't it? Oh yeah, very much so. Outside the house <laughs> <laughs> because writers have been suffering the COVID isolation all their lives, not just for the last two years. <laughs> right, right. Except we haven't been able to see our families either. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's still nice to be able to go and see people. I think, I think the last convention I did was a trade showing called Gamma in, in Reno. And it was literally the week before I think I came back and things got shut down or, or two weeks later it got shut down. And we, we were like knocking elbows and bumping fists then. And uh, I don't think we were wearing masks though, but it was like, we were all like, we think this is probably going to be the last time we see each other for a long time. Everyone was like, and it was so true. We, uh, I, I, I had planned, um, Emerald city comic con was my last planned convention. Uh, and then COVID hit kind of, it started trickling in and we were like, Oh, well, we'll see. Maybe it's not as bad as they're talking about and everything. And then, mm. and then I think like the eight days leading up to COVID, it was just a string of everybody saying, yeah, I'm not going yeah. and just cancel, cancel, cancel. And then I think the show got canceled in general, but oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's wild. Do you think, um, as somebody who kind of, who does a, a creative thing for a living, but works in kind of more of an office environment where you're doing a lot more collaboration and things like that. Do you think COVID has kind of changed how you'll do business going forward at all? Oh yeah. We got rid of our office. Really? So we used to have, we used to have 30 people in an office, um, over three floors. We kept the smallest floor. That's cute. It's got a little balcony overlooking Fulham. Um, so my wife Rita goes there. It's about, it's enough for about six people. We've got all our kind of samples and crap stored there uh, that probably in about 10 years we'll realize that we don't need because no one's ever touched it. And um, there's loads of samples of my, you know, my game, a lot of my games collection is there. So we've kept that, but we've saved a load of money. We've moved the whole company's online. We use a thing called monday.com as our kind of project planning virtual office space. And we're way more in touch with the business, way more in control of the business. And now we can hire people all over the world. Like we've hired three people in America um, in the last uh, three or four months. And that wouldn't have been something we would have done two years ago. It would have been like, well, we need people to come into the office. Like, and that we, you know, we've totally freed our recruitment ability up. So I work from home. I, I think there's a, it is nice working from home. Like you get to eat better because you can go to the fridge, but you also eat more because you can go to the fridge. <laughs> yeah. you know? So I definitely eat better because I'm not going to the local shop to get a sandwich and eating more bread and whatever. But I think people unknowingly miss the, Hey, so what, you know, having that, making the coffee in the morning, how, what do you guys do at the weekend? Hey, should we go for a beer after work? Yeah, let's go. And then you meet so-and-so's sister or their friend, and then you all go out and then you start dating. And do you know what I mean? It's that kind of social um, mixing that you can't plan. Yeah. Because just by accident, you meet someone else's friend and then you start dating that because they met for a pint after work. And it's, um, so people, and I don't think people, I mean, of course you can organize that, but there's a lot of like, life is full of accidents and nature relies on us meeting by pure accident and not planning to meet. So I think um, to, there's a certain amount of sort of ad hoc lifestyle that, that people are missing. And maybe what it would be nice is people will starting to go, I want to come back to the, I want to go to the office. Can I come two days a week or three days a week? And, um, and I think that we might find that people start to do that because, you know, I'm blessed with a decent house uh, that I can work in two or three places. But a lot of people, especially in big cities, are in bed sits. You know, that idea like, a, you know, you live in one room, right? You've got your bed. Just the tiny studio. Yeah. Yeah. And that can drive you crazy. And I've been in a place like that when I first came to London. And so young people faced with having to work from home, it's torturous, I think. And I, I, there's no wonder you want to get out. I used to, you know, I was like excited to get out of the house and travel through London and go to some office, a cool office and sit there and work and meet other the people. Cause I wanted to meet people. I was desperate to meet new people in London. So, you know, once you, you know, when you've got a family and you've got friends and you've got your life and you know where to go and you know who to talk to, it's great to be, to be working from home. But when you're kind of young and new and, um, you know, you've got your life ahead of you, I think 
think a lot of people, they think it's cool being able to work from home, but actually you're missing out so much. Yeah. Well, and that's not just kind of, that's not just kind of on the personal level. It's on the professional level too. You know, those, those happy accidents at, you know, conventions, for instance, is a great place for that kind of, you know, you just yeah. oh, of course. happen to meet, you know, somebody who's in charge of, you know, a novel line. And then they look at you and say, yeah, yeah. Oh, do you want to write something for us? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh no, for sure. Like we met at a convention, you know, so, yeah. uh, I mean that, is all stuff that we miss out on. But, you know, it's it's like when you go, I was walking down the street and I just bumped into so-and-so and you don't get that if you don't go out as much, um, you know, and it's, you just never know. And that's what, I think that's the most amazing thing about life is there are unbelievable, amazing connections that are literally just around the corner and you don't know they're going to happen. But if you don't, if you don't go in there anywhere, they won't happen. Like um, I met my wife, Rita, uh, at a picnic and I was hung over playing PlayStation on the sofa on a good Friday and, uh, terrible time to be hung over, I must say. Um, <laughs> and, um, this friend, a mutual friend rang up and said, Oh, I'll come to this picnic. It's going to be really nice. And I was like, oh, I could just stay here. It's really nice. And make some pasta, just veg out, play it. And I, no, no, you've got to come, you've got to come. And so I did. And then I met my wife, Rita, my soon to be wife. And, um, so you just don't know. And, and that's why go, going out, going to places is just can be life changing. Well, and it's kind of funny that you started off kind of talking about connections like that, because I, I kind of looking through your career, I, I find it really fascinating in terms of the series of jobs that you've done <laughs> that from at least kind of a layman's perspective, all seem to be jobs that you have excelled at in in ways that you need connections to excel you need to be able to know how to talk to people know how to make the right kind of uh the right approach the right uh business connection personal connection that kind of thing because you so was it right at the beginning of your career that you were kind of uh you were a booking agent for music acts right well i actually started when i was 16 i went to a christian rock festival in the uk called glastonbury uh, not glastonbury uh greenbelt mm -hmm. which was the size of glastonbury and reading rock festival and it was like those three festivals were the big thing in the 70s and we went when I, I was with a, like a church youth club and we went there, it was like 50,000 people and they'd have all the big bands playing, but it was all like Christian youth clubs and things. And my mind was blown as like a 14 year old or something. And after I went to that, I was like, oh my God, I want to do this thing. I want to organize things. How do I organize things? And I couldn't find any books about it. So I would write to the organizer and plead to them to meet at a, you know, and let me ask them questions and um, and then when I was sixteen, I started organising a youth uh, a youth thing called Link Up, which was the idea. It was four of us who were all sixteen year olds. We refused the help of all the adults, and we would drive around. This is before internet, this is, because this is in the eighties. We would drive around. We find out where other youth clubs were. We'd drive around and go. We're going to do this big event at a, at this church in Lamington, my hometown, on this date. Will you come? And so we would just went and invited loads of people. And then we did these events with like two, 300 people over the course of uh, a couple of years. So I, and then I went to college and bizarrely, I was, I ended up as chairman of the gaming society and, he, and at the same time, publicity secretary for the Christian union. That was very amusing because it was like kind of around the time it was the D, you know, well, this is, uh, uh early late eighties. So there was still a kind of like, Oh, those demon worshippers. Yeah. I'm the chairman of that lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was, I remember people going, Oh, but there's that, it's all evil. There's that get, there's that monster manual with a demon. It's like, you mean this book with like, I mean, seriously guys, if that is what you think a demon looks like, you've got some, a real horrific awakening coming when you see a real demon. That is a terrible, terrible, appalling, you know, I mean, this is the monster manual, right? The classic monster manual. Right. It is an appalling drawing. Like if that is not a, a, a real drawing, that is like a school college grad drawing of a demon. If you were to gauge it by art quality <laughs> these days. And then another funny story is that uh, some, there was some parents being shown around college and just as they walked into our room, we were playing D and D I just went. And so Satan said, 
and then looked up at them expectantly. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a good sense of humour then. Um, and uh, just because I know there was like literally Jesus would be playing role playing games because it's so much fun and you get to talk to people and um, help them get out of their shell. So I was like, what are you guys all talking about? You know, get a life. So, uh, so then I was basically, and I ran for social secretary. So through all those things, I got really used to talking to lots of people, you know, pitching my idea for an event or come to the society or whatever it was. And, you know, uh, gaming really brought me out of my shell, like playing Dungeons and Dragons. I discovered when I was nine, mm-hmm. I was very shy as a kid. Uh, and then the music festival helped me bring it, uh, bring me out and then doing the events myself when I was 16 and just having to talk in front of lots of people really, really was a crash course in not being shy anymore. <laughs> That's, that sounds terrifying to me. Was, like, I, I think I was, I was a shy kid until I was 30. Like, <laughs> you know what I think I, I did it. Part of it was like, but I'm really shy and nerdy. So if I do this, maybe people will think I'm cool, but it stopped me being shy. Like I literally, I mean, I was still relatively shy in my twenties, but I just, I had to talk in front of, get up in on a microphone. And I don't know whether you hide behind that doing that thing, but it definitely stopped me being the little shy kid who would, I mean, my mum would, would top told my brother to take him to play Dungeons and Dragons for God's to, with your friends just to get him out of the house. Cause I would be stuck in the house. So, um, so, you know, a, a combination of gaming and then events, well, going to a, a youth club and going to these events really helped bring me out of my shell. But, um, so then I was really involved in talking to people and then, yes. So then I became a booking agent because I booked a, a concert for this guy at our college. Um, and he really liked me for some reason and then offered me a job to road manage him. So I would do that as a kind of freelance gig and pick him up and drive him to gigs around the country for him to perform. And, and then I got a job with a, a London based agency where we were booking bands on tour, but all the big rave bands, like all the, uh, so I'd end up at, at, um, club nights till sort of six in the morning with, you know, everyone else is popping pills and I'm, I'm still relatively shy, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, now I'm talking to East London, gangster rave party promoters like all right mate how's it going i'm having a proper wicked one tonight yeah yeah okay yeah all right yeah (laughs) (laughs) but then i would let i learn i'm really i'm I'm a i'm a bit of a simulcrum so i pick up accents really quickly so then i'm quickly to all right but yeah yeah it's a wicked mate yeah this is great like all really good and then the next minute i'm taught i met some lord like oh hello jamie yeah it's very super lovely um so i had this mad mad i don't know crazy time i also remember i had to work with eddie izzard we booked him for this comedy tent at a massive rave party and i found myself talking like him his same mannerisms which is very embarrassing so i <laughs> don't know why i do that yeah so i was very just everything i did i had to talk to people so i just i guess i got good at convincing people to do what i wanted <laughs> <laughs> so and, and maybe I was the one that wasn't off my head on pills at four in the morning. So they gave me the job of telling people what to do. Right. This person is responsible, but also understands us kind of thing. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, one of the worst bits was doing a, um, a proper hardcore techno party every Friday night till nine in the morning from 10 o'clock at night with the sweat dripping from the ceiling. And me and this other guy, Andy, who also didn't do drugs, would sit there doing the membership desk, which was basically five quid, <laughs> five pounds, seven dollars. And you get, you put, you write your name on a card and we laminate it and that's your membership card. And then you get half price entrance next time you come. And you'd have all these <laughs> very lovely ravers munching their mouth off because they're on silly amounts of ecstasy um, going, watch this all about then whilst banging techno is playing at 127% decibels over what it should be. And <laughs> after like losing your voice, you're just going, read the effing sign. <laughs> Look, <laughs> five pounds membership, read the sign. <laughs> like you lose all patience, but um, it was great fun days. I, don't, I probably lo- have damaged my hearing as a result, but uh, There you go. It was good fun. (laughs) 
Hey, Page Break listeners. Brian here, rudely interrupting myself for a bit of a plug. Making a podcast isn't free, and I'm hoping that you enjoy it enough to pitch in a pittance. To do so, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak, where you can toss as little as $3 a month into the tip jar, $5 a month to get the podcast ad-free and early, and $10 a month to hear your name in the credits and feel a smug sense of superiority. You can also buy my books from your favorite retailer or direct from my website. Thanks to everyone who contributes. Now back to me. I, I'm always fascinated, kind of as somebody who grew up in the 90s and kind of, you know, the internet was uh, was a thing by the time I had have decent memories. And, you know, it was a very early thing, but it was still a thing. I'm always very fascinated by kind of the world before cell phones and the internet yeah. and especially in big cities which i again i did not grow up in a big city i grew up in the countryside yeah. and it it just it feels so chaotic and unknowable to me like this idea that if you wanted to get a hold of somebody you had to track down a, a payphone and hope that they were going to be at the number that you called them you know things like that yeah or that you would i mean you just got really good at pre-arranging stuff go oh let's all meet up at so and so's on Wednesday night. Okay. And you would just go. You wouldn't uh I mean of course you could ring them. You would ring people before they went to school or college or work, or you would ring them after work and hope that they were there and of course answering machine messages. I, we uh we had this game. I shared a flat with this girl who was a model and for a while this guy, Keith, who's a soul singer from America, who is hilarious, and we would construct the most ridiculous dramatic answering machine messages that would scare the hell out of people or just make them lose themselves laughing and to just because it was a game and then people would leave funny messages but yeah you would just you just kind of planned like i, I remember arranging a, a, to to go on a date with a girl and i turned up at her flat and she thought i'd said to meet at this other place so we were both sat there and i couldn't get hold of her because she didn't have we didn't have mobile phones you know yeah and um you, you know that happened and you know you'd miss people and or you'd wait longer because you got nothing else to do you know uh, or you'd sit around ugh, when i was a kid i'd sit around waiting for people to call at home you know and thinking well maybe they'll call so i better stay in it's like just no just go out it's like <laughs> you know and that i soon changed that once i got out of my shyness you know well, yeah, it's, it, it is weird thinking back because I remember having my first kind of brick phone that could just text. You could send text, but that was expensive um, or make a call. And um, I remember the first phone where you could like look at Internet pages and they were so terrible and pointless. And then at one point I remembered like, I just want a phone that just just has a signal all the time. I don't care about anything else. I just want a signal. And texting is fine. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's got to be kind of strange looking back on kind of especially a career where you, uh, centered on organizing things like organizing has just it's got to be like unrecognizable to what it used to be. I mean, some of it's uh, I mean, of course, there's all the tools of organizing. So like an online tool, you know, and how you promote an event, but just organizing. Like, I mean, I ended up doing a business course, a two year business course at college, which was the best thing I could have done. The college I went to, and it was what we call a lower, an HND, which isn't a degree. You'd call it a lower degree, but if you've got a degree, you're like, that's not a degree. <laughs> but our course was so practical. So in the first year, we um, we had to start a business in, in theory, but we had to go and find out the rent of the office that we were going to rent, what the electrics would cost, Go and get a quote for the printing for your flyers or whatever it is. Cost everything out for your business. And in the year two, we got given the money to run a business based on, a, and I ended up as the chairman of the company that had the money in the college to invest in everyone. Don't know how, I, I think no one else wanted to do it. I don't think it was <laughs> for talent. Um, and um, so it was very practical. We had to actually do it. And so like literally organizing things is like running a business. It's being able to plan and get stuff done is, is mm -hmm. what's order do you do things? How, how do you find out how to organize something? Well, okay. What do you want to organize a, a murder mystery party? Well, we need a game. So let's 
where do you look for games? We look online or you go and buy one in a shop, you know, how are you going to invite, you know, you're going to need some costumes, you know? So it's like the logical steps of doing anything is, is what you figure out. And weirdly enough, word of advice, everyone on the business course got offered a job as they left college. The degree students didn't, you know, uh, we literally, every single one of us got a decent job offer uh, because business courses are so much in demand. Well, and it's, it's practical knowledge. Like I, I feel like, yeah, no. I, I, I feel like that certainly kind of lacked in my education was kind of that practical application of things. And I, I feel like, I feel like a lot of people lack that in their education. And then you oh, get too, creative yeah. people who are kind of maybe by nature, a, a lot of times quite disorganized and, and they don't want to plan things they, they like being creative. They like being spontaneous yeah, yeah. and things like that. And so like, like I look at other authors and it, it feels like there's, there's, a, there's all, uh, always a dearth of like that, uh, that really solid ability to know how to uh, plan ahead in may, maybe they're really good at plotting, but in their personal life or their business, the, what they run mm -hmm. to kind of bring in the money, like they just have no clue. Yeah. And it's, that's why you always need a good partner who's maybe got the planning skills but it's like I was terrible at doing revision. I would be great at planning my revision. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of weeks would pass. I'd be like, you know, I need to do a new plan. And I would get, I would feel really satisfied that I did a great plan. Like, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, this is going really well. My revision is great. <laughs> Didn't actually do any revision. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But so actually one of the, um, one of my like major moments in my life was walking in to do my, O levels at school going, Oh my God, I haven't done enough for revision. I'm a terrible human being. And I'm so, and I was really worried. And then I was like, actually, I don't know, I don't know how this came about, but I just was this realized the amount of worry isn't going to make any difference to my score today. I'm just not going to worry anymore. And from that moment in my life, I stopped worrying about anything, which is really mental. And, um, I still, I love positive stress. So I love organizing an event and it's like, oh my God, this has happened. How do we, and so now it's a problem to fix. It's an interesting thing. And um, there was a great TED talk actually I saw last year about uh, positive stress, how a lot of people feel stress and it breaks them down. But actually, it, it, I mean, this is summarizing a whole talk, which is very good. The stress feeling is your body's way of saying, here's the energy. I've got it. We're all ready for you. Let's go kill this problem together. And what you read it as is like, oh my God, all this energy feeling is terrible. I feel terrible. Like I can't cope. But actually it's your body going, let's do this. Like here's all the energy you need to fix this problem. Like literally use it. It's all this nervous energy. So I love that nervous energy feeling of like, I've got a problem. I'm going to fix it. How are we going to fix it? This is like a really interesting thing. And so I use it in a positive way. Uh, and I, you know, and I occasionally I still, I don't, I'm not stressed, but I like, you know, of course things happen. You're like, Oh, you know, that's a shame. How am I going to cope with that? But like, I just don't worry about stuff because you know, it's not going to make any difference at all. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like that a lot, actually, that idea of kind of turning that, that thing that we're all kind of trained to be afraid of turning it into a positive experience. Well, cause we all talk about it. Like everyone's like, Oh, I'm so stressed about this. That is not, you know, you're, you're talking about a fake thing. Um, what you should be saying is my body's giving me bucket loads of energy to fix this problem. But instead I'm just going to sit here and, um, and cause I don't actually want to fix the problem. And I mean, I, I know I'm oversimplifying things and people have terrible times and it's really hard. And, and of course, if you've got lots of problems, it can be hard to see over the mountain. Yeah. Uh, so that is an oversimplification. But um, once you can, and I was lucky that I broke it with something as dumb as, you know, school exams. Right. Uh, which, you know, looking back on my life, you know, it's, it wouldn't have mattered. Who cares what exam results you get? I have it has absolutely no meaning on my life. And for most people, it has no meaning on your life. I'm not saying you shouldn't get do good in your exams, but you know, you can, I got by with terrible results <laughs> and uh, ended up doing what I wanted to. I mean, I was fortunate, you know, and I worked hard, but um, you know, it's uh, yeah, li life is complicated, but I think y if you can find a way to break the, the, the hold of stress on you can be life changing. 
Um, and I always say, you know, is people think oh, I've got so many problems. It's like you've got a, a massive pile of tiny, tiny, tiny little problems. And uh, I remember when I was when I was uh, first a booking agent, there was someone I really wanted to represent, and it seemed impossible. And I was like, actually, you know what? Let me break this down. They're really hard to get to, but actually, I know someone who knows their manager. Now, maybe I could engineer a meeting with this and then bring it. And basically, it was a whole series of little problems to solve. And I eventually managed to rep them. And that made me realize I could get anything I wanted if I if I broke it down into the little problems. And, and it's uh, big, stressful problems are just that in reverse. You know, you've just got to go. And, and, and the trouble is we're blocked by it. We're like, we just, all you see is this huge, huge, insurmountable problem that we then get buried and we and the stress drains all our energy rather than we feed on the energy. And what we've got to do is just take the first step to go, yeah, but I just need to make this one phone call and maybe, and that gives me another day here. And if I can pay this and then, you know, but it's like, don't try, you can't pay 10 grand, but if you can pay 20 quid here to get that moving and make, write this letter and it's like, just write the letter. Don't forget about what the letter is going to lead to. It's like those one little steps. And it is ever so hard for people who are faced with, in you know, huge problems like that to sometimes find the energy. But once you can get someone started, I think it's amazing. And I, I always talk to every time I meet someone who's got problems, I just go, let's dial this back. What is the one little thing that you could do? And it's, um, it's great when you see people kind of start to fix stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very cool attitude. I, I like that a lot. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, Modifius because I, I, I thought it was very funny that you started a company, you got married and then you immediately started a company with your new wife. Well, we actually started the, the name started the year before we got married. We started the brand kind of the year we met and um, it was a way to kind of make some money to pay for holidays actually. And then I started to think about creating this world acting Cthulhu. And then the idea of Kickstarter came along and then we got married in the summer, sorry, in the, in the spring and um, started to kind of grow the gaming world through that year and then built up towards doing the big Kickstarter. So yeah, it was, um, it was Rita that kind of, because I was doing fashion at the time and she knew I wasn't really happy. And, um, you know, it was her that kind of gave me the idea to just do what you love, you know, and, uh, or, you know, do anything you want. And it was, we started thinking about mad ideas whilst I was in Belarus with her the first time. And, uh, you know, it was, and because Kickstarter came along, I suddenly realized, well, the thing I really love is tabletop games. And now there's a way to fund tabletop games because before that, you know, you were, you know, you, unless you were one of the established companies, it was very hard to break in and you know, without spending a load of money, which is kind of not the point <laughs> if you want to make one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And that's, that's how we got going. And it made me, you know, it's this guy I first road managed had always said there's, you know, probably half a dozen jobs you can do well, but only one you'll starve for. And that's the one you truly love. And that's the one you'll do really well at because you love it. And the money will come. Don't chase the money. The, if you're doing what you really love, the money will eventually come. And it did because if you're running a business, you know, all the businesses I'd had before, didn't, you know, I had a, a fashion company. I didn't really love fashion. I love video games and we would, we made clothing based on video games, but I only loved 50% of the company, you know, the concept. And before that I'd been in, you know, in music and it was fun working with bands and going to parties, but I didn't really love music. I didn't like, you know, just, I oh, can't wait to hear the latest songs. You know, it's like, it was just fun. Right. So it was a 50%, you know, I loved 50% of the job. And so Modifius was the first time I loved a hundred percent of the job. And it, you know, the, the fashion company, we, we had it for 13 years and the biggest, and maybe after eight years, it was, it was about eight people. And Modifius was eight people after like, two years or three years and now wow. we're 50, 55 people Dang. so um you know when you really love something i think it comes across in the way you talk about the games and your enthusiasm your passion 
the fact that you're willing to burn extra hours to put so much more energy in and you just work harder on something you truly give a damn about you know what happened to the fashion company did you sell it off or i mean it's i started it with another guy he left it gosh it you know it went we, we got some investment it you know, it went down and then another guy bought it out and then I was just working for it. So mm. I was still involved and they were like, yeah, we're going to make it even bigger. But he kind of ran it into the ground again. <laughs> and I, I'd literally been there and bought the t-shirt and was had enough of it really. So it was good timing for me to get out and, um, you know, and, and it was good fun. Fashion is also great fun, but it wasn't a hundred percent of my passion, you know. I could do it. I could do it well. And I cared enough about it to do it well, but I didn't love it. I didn't love, oh, you know what? I just really want to find that latest cotton, <laughs> <laughs> that cotton texture or that latest color for this season. It was, uh, you know, kept me busy for 13 years until I met Risa. Well, something that really struck me kind of from the first time you and I started talking was kind of how the massive or at least massive in terms of the way I think of them as culturally and and as part of my fandoms, um, the massive kind of uh, properties that you have gotten to work with mm. uh, with Modifius, and I was I was curious how how do you end up with you know Fallout with you know Star Trek or Skyrim you know like do you just start asking questions you find out who's got the rights and and then ask. I was lucky that the the t-shirt company had lots of licenses. So we, we got Atari and uh, Activision and Midway and Space Invaders. So we, we'd done a lot of licensing deals. Um, so we knew a lot of the gaming video games companies. Um, so, and, and I was used to doing licensing deals. So when I started Modifius and we did our first project, which was Acton Cthulhu, which was our own world, the, I knew some people or an agent who said, oh, and I mentioned I was doing this now. And she said, well, we've got this old property, Mutant Chronicles, that, you know, we're looking for someone to reboot. And I was like, oh, God, yes. It was basically, you know, Mutant Chronicles was like Games Workshop from the 90s. And, you know, it was this really cool Swedish property and it was a lot of fun and I was a big fan of it. So I was like, hell yeah. So I did a Kickstarter for that the following year and we did well with that. And that was our first little license you know because it was wasn't an active license and we got it going again and then using that i then went to itv who i'd been talking to about clothing rights for thunderbirds and said i'm not doing clothing anymore i'm doing games you fancy doing a board game for thunderbirds and they were like sure if you want to it was like so i managed to get a good deal there and so that was our next project and we got matt leacock the big tabletop games designer on board for it and did a Kickstarter. And then off the back of that, we then got, gosh, I'm trying to remember which, which order. It was either in, I think it was Infinity and then Conan. Uh, so Conan was the same people as Mutant Chronicles. And then uh, I met a guy that I hadn't seen in like 10 years. Actually, no, 20 years. And he was running the studio doing Star Trek Online. And he was like, oh, how's it going? And I said, oh, you know, um, I'd love to do something with Star Trek. He's like, oh, I'll do an introduction for you. So I got an intro to CBS and they were like, look, we just haven't got the time and it's a lot of work. And, you know, we're just like three people at the moment in the licensing team. I was like, okay, sure. And then I just, every f- three months, I'd be like, hey, how's it going? And then eventually I was like, I tell you what, I will pay for someone to do the work to handle our approvals if we can get the rights. And they were like, oh, okay, yeah, maybe that could work. And I was like, oh, God, have I just committed to paying some crazy New York or L.A. salary? In the end, they didn't ask me to do that. They just expanded their team anyway. And and, and then it was like uh, probably about two years of talking. And then I remember the day this woman emailed me and said, right, we're ready. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then And then actually having the contract was like, oh, gosh, that's like – you know, our world changed. And that, when we went on, on pre-order with Star Trek, our, that leveled the company up, you know, our web sales tripled overnight, such a big difference. And it was, it was a real turning point. And, and also cause we couldn't do a Kickstarter with it. It was like a pre-order. So it was all f- rather than this massive Kickstarter and then like a gradual run out, this was like big pre-order and then just kept going, you know? So, um, and then off the back, you know, so again, 
you're using everything you've done so far to get the next one, you know? So Star Trek, I was like, well, look, we did this with Thunderbirds, this with Conan, this with Mutant Chronicles. We, we know what we're doing with licenses. And so it was all the track record. And then, you know, cause I couldn't just go straight to a fallout. And then actually I'd been talking to Bethesda about fallout for clothing also for the fashion label. And I remember one day going, Oh my God, of course I know the people at Bethesda. What am I doing? <laughs> like I rang them up and I was like, could we do, and it took me again, took me a few months to get someone on the phone and, and then they kept changing. And then it was like another year. And then I would just keep persevering whilst I was doing everything else. And then, um, eventually I got this guy on the phone and he was like, okay, so what do you want to do? I was like, so, well, you know, could we do a board game? No, we're already doing that with, uh, as with fantasy flight. I was like, uh, okay. Like thinking, how about Warhammer fallout? And they were like, sure. Sounds okay. <laughs> Send me a pitch. So we put this big pitch together. And then again, it was like another year and a half until, um, cause they were just so busy and, and this isn't big money for them, you know? And, um, you know, eventually it was like, okay, this is it. We're, we're doing the deal. I was like, what? Oh my God, here we go. And, uh, I remember, you know, that was really playing with the big boys because it's big contracts and we had to get lawyers involved and, you know, but it was worth it. They've, they've been fantastic to work with really lovely team. And it's always very scary at the beginning because, you know, they're very strict and, you know, because it's a massive property and you've got to get everything right. But once they once they can see that you know what you're doing and you they you love the property as much as their team, then, then it, you know, it just gets so much easier. And then it just got on from there. And we, you know, we've done more with, you know, got Elder Scrolls and, uh, and then um, James Bond, you know, because that's coming this spring, Spe- the Spectre game. And that, again, another mad story. That was... Um, I've always been trying to get, uh, you know, a massive fan of James Bond since I was a kid and, you know, Eon are very hard to contact, you know, I would just send an email every so often to their standard <laughs> email inbox and got to kind of no, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Don't, don't try again. Um, and then, uh, we got working with, uh, Agatha Christie. Someone brought us his card game to release and, um, I said, I was thinking, oh, maybe we can do something with the Fleming estate because they were doing the comic books. And I just happened to say to the guy who's the descendant of Agatha Christie who runs the company, it's like, you don't happen to know the Fleming estate, do you? On on an email, like, you know, six o'clock on a Wednesday. And then I kind of went home and then there was an e- then he set, he sent an email to this woman at the Fleming estate going, oh, hi, Emma, um, you know, Chris is interested in doing something with James Bond. Maybe you guys can help. And then she went, oh, no, Chris, you need to speak to David David at so and so um, at Eon Productions. I'm CCing him now in Hollywood, you know. And then David, then later that night, this is all overnight, right? Right. Emails back going, uh, Susie, you know, uh, is at our UK office. She's looking after licensing. Susie, can you have a meeting with Chris next week? Oh, my God. Literally ping pong overnight. And then I've got a meeting with them the next week. So... Um, and now we're doing a board game, which is just, it's, you know, like the whole idea of like, um, having met these people sending a nice email, can you help? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't happen often like that. <laughs> well, that's amazing. But you also had kind of the run up to that was you just kind of trying to be, uh, you know, trying to keep at it and trying to get someone. So the other ones, the roots worked eventually. It was just that perseverance, you know, but we didn't have contact and they were, yeah. very, they were a very small team. Like, so it's not like a big company. And, um, uh, and they weren't really doing much licensing. I think, you know, it's all luxury stuff. So, um, I think we just, it's just right time, right people, you know, the, um, and they were, you know, they loved the idea. And now finally the game's coming out and, and except they just killed off, you know, <laughs> Spectre. In the new movie. <laughs> yeah, see, see how that goes. Uh, which I had a go at them about. As I went in for a meeting at their beautiful offices in Mayfair, overlooking Hyde Park, and I just watched the film. We had a meeting. It was like, so, <laughs> we're making a game about Spectre, and you know you just killed them all. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. So we did have a laugh about it. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah. Uh, that's it's such a wild kind of series of connections now i'm curious because in the kind of author world there's a lot of talk uh about whether fans are there for you the author or whether they're there for the world that you have made them love um so for me it would be whether they like brian mcclellan or whether they like powder mage right Mm -hmm. 
I'm kind of curious if there's kind of if that's something that goes through your head in term in for a gaming company of are these people coming back to us to get our games or are they only coming in because of the properties that we can give them? I think something like Star Trek, they're coming to it for Star Trek and it, they'd come to Star Trek, whether it was us or someone else making it. If it's something a bit more obscure, I think they might be like, oh, I'll take a look because it's Modiphius. If it was like, a, you know, Act and Cthulhu, we just relaunched for our 2D20 rule system. I think they're, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you did a great job with all these other games. We're going to take a look at your, your world. Um, now, interesting comparison is going back to Clubland days. So we used to organize Universe, the company, would organize a night called Voyager, a techno night, at a club called Complex Club on a Friday night with, say, a big French DJ, techno DJ called Laurent Garnier on a Friday night. I would, because you know, I was on the membership desk, I would speak to lots of people. And the average person is just, it's really good at Complex on a Friday night. <laughs> they didn't care that it, we were this big promoter that the what the brand of the night they just knew this club was good on a friday night it had the music they liked yeah. don't know who that dj is playing even though we paid him loads of money and then about i don't know maybe 20 percent were the like oh yeah laurent garnier is amazing i've come here to w- watch laurent garnier or yeah universe are amazing they always do good i'll go to any universe event so that <laughs> You know, Modiphius doing a 2D20 game of Star Trek, you know, I suppose is, is, is a lot less conditions, but I, I think it's very brand led. So I think now for a writer, if you were writing a Star Wars book, I'd say there's a huge p- percentage. But then again, saying Star Trek's a hard one because there's loads of Star Trek books and lots of writers. So, you know, I don't know, pick a property where there's one writer. Like, so I'd say a large percentage probably the property, but then they will then, if they like the book, they'll then go, Oh, and what else Brian wrote? Oh, okay. I'm going to go and read his other action adventure book or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it is hard. Um, I think when it's, um, and you know, a, a not a lot, a licensed property, you, you know, you win someone is, I, I think maybe it's more combination of the world, but just cause you, you know, let's say you write a fantasy story. If you then wrote a modern day secret agent book, you might lose me because I'm not really into that as a, as a fiction, but I, I'd read, um, any, you know, I like my science fiction or fantasy. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I I don't know. I don't know. Anyone's done any research, actual quantitative research into, you know, how many of your fans will read anything you've written (laughs) versus they'll move on to the next fantasy author. Right. It's all speculation with that kind of thing. You know, you you never know. And it's, and it's hard to know whether whether having that knowledge is super useful or not, you know, because you, you, you have to keep producing. Yeah. Well, I guess, but if you knew that all the fans of your fantasy book were not going to then read something that's not fantasy, you'd probably decide to write another fantasy book, right? Yeah. That would pr- probably be quite useful to know. I mean, we um, we did we did some vague research into how many of our fans have bought into all the games. And, um, so we're trying to figure out if we just release another 2d 20 game, do you get a certain amount of percentage? And it, it's not, um, we haven't, there's not a definitive answer yet. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a small percentage, I think. So w- weirdly enough, we have a lot of unique fans for each property, which is fans of those properties, I think. Right. And I, I guess when it comes to those crossovers is you, you never know when a fan will like one property and a second property or a third or a fourth. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're doing something science fiction, there's a decent chance they're going to like more science fiction. You know, if they're into Conan, they're probably into Dungeons and Dragons. If they're, yeah, you know, um, or or you get the fantasy fans that don't like Dungeons and Dragons come to Conan. You know, it's always being you know interesting niches win, and a, and, a, and a niche in tabletop can be actually pretty big. But if you do it really well and 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 um, dive into that niche and make it a big niche, you know, or, or kind of make the most of the niche. Don't try and soften the edges, go hard, you know, make it's, I think that's the best way. So 
So where do you where do your duties kind of lie with the company these days? Um, well, technically, I'm chief creative officer, which means I get to stick my nose in and uh, make uh, people's lives. <laughs> hell if I change something. Well, I try not to do that as much as I used to. Um, so I get to you know, obviously, as one of the founders and directors of the company, we have to sign off on the publishing plans and, you know, and, but I have my own projects. So I have a thing called Via Modifius where I, I find kind of A&R, find cool new gaming projects. You know, my big thing is solo wargaming and uh, cooperative gaming. Uh, I, I have particular projects I focus on like the Skyrim board game that we did, uh, which we've been working on last year, you know, where you know, if we're doing a crowdfunding, it's very personal. So I, you know, I'm involved in leading that. Uh, although we had a much bigger team, so I didn't have to do much as much this time, which was a big relief. So I try and be involved where I can make the most difference and I care. And I, you know, and I let, try to let people as much as I can get on with stuff in the company. Like Star Trek was my baby at one point, but I handed it over to the team and they're doing a great job, doing a better job than if I was doing it probably. Um, you know, fallout was a really big thing for me for a while. And it's one of our major things in the, in the, in the business, you know, brings in most, a lot, well, most of the money. So, you know, I, I, I love fallout, but I have to be more involved sometimes, but it, it, again, the team are doing a great job, but I've got my new IPs I'm working on. So I'm trying to spend more time creating and, and less managing stuff where, you know, the business is doing quite well with it when you're looking at like a, a new property that you might be able to get you know get a hold of do you find yourself kind of almost automatically thinking okay this is one i'm probably going to have this duty on and i'll be involved in this way but oh maybe this other property it's a brilliant property but i think this other person in the company is probably better to take care of all this stuff yeah sometimes it's well we, we've looked at a few licenses where i've said look there's this opportunity and I'll be honest, it's, it's not something I'm massively into. Is anyone into it? Because if they are, then it's worth it. But if they're not, then we should pass on it because there's no passion in the company for it. It's always good when lots of people are into the project and we're like, oh, wow, we'd all love to work on it. There's, there's a license we're doing at the moment where a lot of us are really into it. And some of the buzz is just getting the deal done. It's like, I brought, you know, we brought it in, but, you know, and I've got some, you know, good ideas and, and we'll all sit around and talk about it. And it's a creative team. And then, you know, we've got a good head of product, Sam, that goes off and gets it done. Uh, and then another guy, John, who's our head of creative, who gets all the sculpts and art and uh, graphic design done and painting and everything. So it's, you know, it's a fantastic team to kind of see those vision come through. But I still like doing the stuff myself as well. So like on my project I'm working on at the moment, I'm art directing and I'm leading the writing team and doing the writing meetings. And if anything, I'm trying to free myself up more from the business work to do more of that coalface stuff because I love that. And it's, um, but I get it to the point where I can hand it, hand some of it over to a project manager and move on to the next project, you know? Oh, that's very cool. I I'm, I'm always curious about the art with RPGs because the art is, I I don't I feel like I'm I'm in this uh, maybe I'm not alone but I feel like I'm the type of gamer who is uh, who buys a, like a new game book like ninety percent for the art because I yeah. there's a pretty good chance I'm not even going to play it but like like for instance like your guys's Dune game when I saw that came out I immediately ordered the special edition because I'm like yeah. I don't have a gaming group right now that I'm going to play this with but I want this book on my shelf. It's so dang cool looking. Yeah. Now they did a great job on the artwork and we had access to all the concept art from the movies so that we could um base, you know, the concepts on stuff that's happening in the films. Um so it was uh you know really good opportunity. And it you know it was one of my bugbears when I before I started Modifius you know, I think in my twenties, I was out of gaming for about six years when I was doing the big techno parties, just no time. And I came back excited to a gaming shop to discover how things had changed. And they hadn't, the art was still terrible. It was all black and white interiors, pages and pages and pages of text. And like art, the artwork that was there was often you like who commissioned this art, who paid their mate at school to do this piece of art. It was appalling. And like, you expect me to pay money for it? Like seriously. So that's why, like, right from the get-go, I was like, we've got to do great art. We've got to do colour interiors. We were the first colour, uh, Call of Cthulhu, 
books, you know, full color. And uh, I was like, this has got to be beautiful, you know. And so we've got a good reputation for doing great looking books and, you know, good quality books and, um, you know, hopefully just get better and better at that. And, you know, more and more, you know, our, the art level is going up, you know, and always looking for kind of new cool artists. Um, when did that change really happen? Because it does seem like RPGs tend to be the, very artistic. Like the art is a, a really centered. Kickstarter. Oh, is Kickstarter. Before Kickstarter, it's so expensive to do artwork for a book that you're basically having to imagine trying to fund a book just out of sales where sales weren't really that high. And then Kickstarter comes along and you can pay for all the artwork with the, um, the funding. And um, you, you know how much you can pay for it up front. And then you can... Um, go out there and do deals to bring all the artwork in you want on a budget. So, you, you know, you just, you have budget, but tiny budgets for that's why it was terrible and cheap and black and white before. So, I mean, saying that Dungeons and Dragons sold millions of copies and they still had the, you know, really basic art, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and they, they just wouldn't spend the money if they had a God imagine. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was one of my real things to go, let's just make them look great, you know, so there are as much a work of art as we can and a great game, hopefully. Well, it, it does almost transcend it into almost like a, a coffee table book, right? Like, it, it's something that you can sit and just kind of leaf through without having to read all the crunchy rules and everything. Yeah, because it didn't look like a geek thing anymore. Like, I mean, rather like... You know, when those old role playing books look like you had a book from when you were a teenager with teenage quality artwork and not a serious quality geek gaming product. And yeah. now we have serious looking, you know, you look at, you have, you know, your Dune book or Tales from the Loop or Symbarum or any of those kind of beautiful looking, uh, you know, Star Trek. You're, it's going to look, people are going to go, wow, that looks really cool. You know, what's that? You know, you put a pile of those on your coffee table, people are going to look at them because they look amazing. And, you know, and also with today's desktop publishing at home on your Mac or your PC, there's no excuse not to have a decent looking book, you know, yeah. even with lower budgets now, because you, there's so much stuff you can do. It just takes time. Well, and I, I, I feel like I feel like geekiness has always has has almost become so mainstream with kind of Game of Thrones and the Marvel Cinematic Universe and things like that. And so geekiness has to be professional now, like it, yeah. because it's expected to be professional. Yeah. And it's mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and just, you know, you look at how Dungeons and Dragons has spread and become so much part of popular culture again. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, second, it's, it's second wind. Maybe it'll get it right this time <laughs> um, and, and, and keep in there. But um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you've got to keep up with the other, the other rest of the culture now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I know it's getting pretty late there, so I'm not going to keep you much longer here. I, I like to wrap this up each time by asking every guest what the last thing they ate that blew their mind was. That blew my mind? Yeah. What's the last thing that you ate that you're still thinking about? Uh, good question. I mean, I always love roast lamb and Yorkshire puddings, you know, Sunday roast. Like, it doesn't get old. It's always the best meal ever. And I always, yeah. I always, if I cook it, I make way too many Yorkshire puddings that no, it's just surely not possible for everyone to eat because they'll eat more of them <laughs> and there'll be some left over. What is a Yorkshire pudding? Uh, Yorkshire pudding is um, heat a tray until literally the oil is uh, like a little baking tray until the oil is like ridiculously hot. Mm -hmm. uh, you're mixing um, flour and water and egg it's, it's um and then you know, massively whisk it up and let it settle for about half an hour and then you uh if you use those like little cake trays with like the tiny little uh circles oh like the little muffin trays okay i know what you're talking about now yeah 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 we pour in a little bit of the um mix and put it into the oven when it's like like i just said the oil is freaking hot and then you put it in the oven for about half an hour and it all puffs up and you and you tip gravy on it oh mm. amazing oh a little gravy a little meat with that that does sound amazing yeah oh so good roast like uh roasted vegetables brussels sprouts the whole works ah, oh, i love that there, there is i mean i don't get bored of it i could literally eat it every day <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's such a, i mean it probably would get boring but um 
yeah, Sunday roast, English Sunday roast is just the best. No turkey ever because turkey is the <laughs> work of the devil. It's like the driest meat ever on the planet. don't know why someone would want to eat turkey, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, man, I love it. I haven't actually had lamb for a long time. I should uh, I should get a lamb shake. Roast beef is also good. Yeah. Roast beef or and roast chicken. Or mm-hmm. well, basically just rotate the three so you don't get bored. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That was game designer Chris Birch. Thanks again to Chris for taking the time to chat. You can find links to the Modifius website and Twitter down in the show notes. You can find me, as always, at brianmcclellan.com. Special thanks to James Sutter for music and Tom Bishop for production. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak or buy my books in ebook, paperback, or audio. You can also get signed copies of my books direct from my website or swag from my Redbubble store. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. Huge thanks to Kyle Anderson, Patrick Hunt, Elijah, Glenn with an extra N, and Jennifer and Angela Johnson for their backing on Patreon. <laughs>